I am pleased to welcome you. Participants have been streaming in in the last couple of minutes, and we have registrations from over 37 states and many different sectors for today's important discussion. My name is Sarita Brown, and I serve as president of Excelencia in Education. Our mission is to accelerate Latino student success in higher education. Meeting our mission makes communities stronger and enriches our country with college educated talent for the workforce and civic leadership. For those of you who are just meeting us, Excelencia does our work in very strategic ways. We do our work through the use of data. We focus on evidence-based practices and we are proud to do our work in partnership with educational leaders across the country committed to making their institutions learning environments where Latino students and all their students thrive. Excelencia in Education is hosting today's briefing to discuss timely analysis about Hispanic serving institutions, emerging HSIs, and the role of higher education in serving Latino students and serving all students as our country moves forward. This briefing is part of our comprehensive research project, 25 years of Hispanic serving institutions. And Excelencia brings it to the public with the support of 27 higher education organizations. I hope we've, you've seen their names, you've noted their logos in the materials that you've responded to to be with us here today. We want you to note these institutions. They are led by people with whom we have made common cause and they are working every day to make their institutions magnets for Latino students with high aspirations for their future. We are most honored as we bring this national briefing to you to build on the work of efforts in five states, Florida, New York, California, Texas, and Arizona. And for this briefing, we bring this to you through cooperation with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. Excelencia in Education has a long-standing connection and we have a common purpose. For today, we are so proud to introduce the chairman of the CHC, Representative Raul Ruiz from the great state of California. Representative Ruiz. Good morning. My name is Congressman Dr. Raul Ruiz. I represent California's 36th Congressional District in Southern California. I'm an emergency medicine physician and a public health expert with training in humanitarian and disaster aid. I'm also the chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. It is an honor to be with you all today as Excelencia in Education examines the 25 years of federal investment in Hispanic serving institutions. The Congressional Hispanic Caucus has a long-standing and vibrant working relationship with Excelencia and with impactful events like the one today, we continue to build on that strong foundation. As we look to provide solutions for future generations, it is critical that we examine research on the vital role of Hispanic serving institutions, such as the information being presented today. For many years, Excelencia has conducted research on evidence-based practices and Latino student success. Even the, in these challenging times, Excelencia remains committed to lead and inform the field by sharing its research with policymakers and the public to highlight opportunities available in serving Latino students and supporting the institutions that directly serve them. Education is a critical foundation that many Latino children do not have an opportunity to gain. Hispanic students must have access to an education system that serves their needs and considers the structural inequities that have historically held our students back. Access to higher education and workforce training is critical to getting the American economy back to its place as the leader in the global economy. And a well-trained and educated workforce will benefit all families. 
The CHC is committed to continuing investing in the success of our students and ensure that the institutions that serve them have the resources, programs, and guidance to mold the successful leaders of the future. Sarita and Deborah, thank you for the work that you do at Excelencia in Education. The Congressional Hispanic Caucus looks forward to advancing our common cause for the benefits of our students and for future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Ruiz. Your partnership and your continuing effort to work in cooperation is a source of great strength as together we go forward. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce mi colega, the co-founder of Excelencia in Education, our current CEO, Deborah Santiago. This project is her design. It was developed by a team she leads, and it is the anchor of today's conversation. Deborah, I turn things over to you. Thank you, Sarita. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the team that you're talking about, they've been a critical part of all parts of this overall. So uh, we have Julie Laurel, Emily Lavandera, Jeanette Martinez, Emily Blinska, Brzezinski, and uh, Joanna Sanchez. So thank you all for helping and listening to the kind of work we've been tracking for more than 25 years. Um, I had the good fortune um, 25 years ago, 26 years ago, to be in the Department of Education when Hispanic serving institutions were first funded. And it started this journey of trying to understand what at the federal level and what at the policy level we need to be paying attention to, to make sure that Latino students are served well, how we can rethink what higher education can be, and looking at not just the students of today, but those of tomorrow, who increasingly are, look much more like me and others than many who are making the policy decisions that are taking place. And that kind of created this idea of how do we track the, the evolution of institutions, of effort, of leadership, and our students in ways that can inform dialogue and compel action. And that really is at the core of what we are trying to do to be part of a community that's making a significant difference. And that led to this idea of reviewing the past and informing the future, because I think it's what we are trying to make uh, is an informed decision about where we all need to be and our commitment to our students. So excellence in education, we have three pillars that, that ground us as an organization. Certainly data and research, as is often shared, we wanna make sure that there is clarity. And for those that are focused on action, that they have a baseline that they can build on, build from, as they focus on the students as the core of effort. And we've done that since we started. We also focus on evidence-based practice, as the, the, the chairman, congressman mentioned, um, because it really is important, not just what the data tell us, but what we do as a result. And we found there are lots of good practices across the country. We need to bring attention to them. Um, often there are individuals that are making a difference. And if they get additional dollars, they're gonna focus on the student. And we have to find ways to amplify that there are solutions and opportunities out there to build on. A third part, uh, pillar of our work is really focusing on this common cause. And all of that ties in to take a look at HSIs and the importance they serve in, in turn, making sure that our students are served well. So why are we doing this? At the end of the day, uh, it is about students. And we know that Latino students represent this post-traditional majority of students. Um, often we're in conversations and the focus really is on being traditional or non-traditional. For us, that's a very deficit-based approach. Um, and in fact, less than 20% of students today fit that traditional profile of students who go to traditional institutions and traditional pathways. So we were trying to think of how do we frame an understanding about the students and therefore the institutions that can serve them in a critical way. And for us, this post-traditional lens is absolutely critical because it really does represent actually the majority of students today that don't fit a profile of which we often make decisions and investment in and opportunities to think about institutions and different ways of making that happen that are more aligned with the students' realities, that's the opportunity that's before us. The other element that we think a lot about is, is the context and in this very contemporary environment, not what they institutions have been, but what they can be for our students as they go forward. 
And so we are very aware that even before the challenges, the pandemic, that there were lots of conversations going on about demographic shifts in the country and Latinos as the primary growth population. Um, questions about the value and the sustainability of the business model that undergirds higher education, as well as the challenges of increasing debt and, and potential solutions uh, that could get there. Uh, and then after the pandemic hit, you know, I think uh, the, the structural systemic inequities that some of us have known have been in place since before uh, became more public. And that created yet another opportunity in, in seeing the challenges, but also the opportunities. How can we frame, we reframe our thinking, excuse me, and think about what is possible with the institutions and the students that are permitted to serve well. And that led us to thinking about ways we can um, focus on HSIs and that paradigm going forward. Last is a part of this pandemic is just acknowledging that even in this last year, we took a look at our data and saw that, you know, in 2019, fall 2019, the Latino population, we were the only growth population we had been. And there's a lot of progress in accelerating enrollment. And we were seeing increases in completion as well. Um, and in one year, we saw a precipitous drop and scaling back of the kind of enrollment progress we made, such that uh, we went from a plus of you know 1.4 percent to a, a drop more than all other students about five percent, and that uh, gives us real uh, strength in saying there needs to be a call to action. But the progress we've been making and the opportunity for institutions to do more to make sure we're serving our students is available and before us. So even before the pandemic, we'd taken a look at our data and we try to put together some projections based on what we've done. And we've been tracking this since 2010 um, and noted, noticed that we were seeing acceleration and degree completion by Latino students up until about 2018, where we just hit where our projections expected we would need to be with 6.2 million more degrees to get to a 2030 goal. And in 2019, we were uh, seeing a little bit of a, a drop uh, already, not still growth, but not the acceleration that is core to the mission as Sarita mentioned it. And now thinking about 2020 and what that needs to look like uh, is another opportunity, but a challenge for us to be very concrete about an institutional effort. So why focus on Hispanic serving institution? Um, you know, I think many of us know that this is the coin of the realm in national conversations. Uh, when you talk about Latino students, it doesn't take long before we get to looking at HSIs, what are they? How can we use them as a vehicle and opportunity to get to our students, given what we know about Hispanic student enrollment and the, some of the strength and leadership that exists in HSIs today. And that's why we wanted to make sure that we are focusing on the role of institutions. I think too often in public policy, we have found uh, there's a, a focus on how do we fix students, get students to, to conform, meet what we traditionally are looking for an institution. I think the opportunity with HSIs, even in their, their creation, was the ability to think about what's the institutional role in at least meeting students part of the way. So in defining HSIs, for those of you that are just getting exposed to this for the first time, um, you know, we know that this is a, a construct that was identified in the 1980s by the community and institutional leaders that were looking to find ways to, to recognize where there was concentrated enrollment and look for capacity building and ways to grow uh, and invest in the institutions that disproportionately enrolled and graduated Hispanics across the country. And it was codified in the 1990s when we saw the opportunity in federal legislation to bring attention to these groups of institutions and to find federal investment and support and the institutions that are disproportionately enrolling our Hispanic students overall. So just for the purpose of our discussion, I just wanna be clear because there are lots of definitions and ways of people thinking out there. But we do know that HSIs are, are public or private, nonprofit to free granting colleges that have 25% or more undergraduate full-time equivalent enrollment. And that does matter when you look at calculating institutions. Um, and we know that this definition is based on enrollment and not necessarily mission to serve. We also know that the federal support for Hispanic serving institutions since 1995, when they were first funded, has continued to grow. And um, 
we know that the definition, the purpose, and this, there are other federal agencies that are investing in, in HSIs and, and competitive ways, but we do know that Title V, which has been just kind of a, a groundswell of understanding about HSIs and this developing HSIs program has two primary goals. One is to assist institutions in expanding their educational opportunities for and the improvement, uh, improve the attainment of Hispanic and other low-income students and to expand and enhance HSI's academic offerings, program quality and institutional stability. What you don't see here necessarily is that it is directly tied to student success, right? Except for the improve the attainment of Hispanic and other low-income students. And that's an opportunity for us to take that one uh, purpose and intent and build on it in a more significant way. So that while we're impressed in, in um, focused on institutional capacity and how we can strengthen the quality and the sustainability of an institution, that we're also making sure that there is uh, student success, completion and degrees. We took a look at 25 years of data and saw that there have been over 800 uh, federal grants awarded to HSIs. And remember, this is a competitive program. This is not you don't become an HSI and automatically receive support. You still have to compete. And that has been over $1.9 billion that have been contributed to HSIs over the last 25 years in that effort to expand educational opportunity and enhance the quality and stability of institutions overall. So as again, as we took up data, look at the data over the last 25 years, we know that um, the funding doesn't necessarily match the growth of HSIs. So we're going to show you those numbers in a moment, but um, just wanting to take a look at the money that's involved there with Title V. And we have seen growth, our uh, incredibly significant ebbs and flows. But um, at its max, we were tracking through 1819, we saw that um, up to 200, a little over 200 institutions, HSIs had received Title V money. And the growth has been significant, as I'll show you in a minute. And that creates opportunities to think about what's the, the match, what kind of investment do we have as the numbers of each size continue to grow with enrollment? What should be our expectations or understanding about that investment and what we expect to yield as a result of this investment in the institutions disproportionately low income students? So here's a little bit about what we know over 25 years. We know that. Um, there is significant enrollment and a large part of the enrollment we've seen over the last 25 years of Latinos overall has been at Hispanic serving institutions, <clears throat> over a million. And we know that the numbers of HSIs have grown significantly from about 189, uh, 25, now 26 years ago, uh, with 539 as of last year. And that's a significant growth. Imagine over 350 institutions that have met that definition of an HSI. You know, at Excellencia, we created and popularized this term of emerging HSI in a piece you'd written in 2009-10. We were taking a look at institutions that were about 15 to 24.9%. because we were trying to understand the pipeline of what gets you to that 25%. And we've seen a significant growth in institutions that are in that pipeline to become HSI. And also the institutions that have graduate programs, each size with graduate programs. And we've seen some growth uh, relative to the need and the opportunity in front of us. We also know that HSIs are incredibly diverse. It's not, we're not just Hispanic. Um, we have a large 75% of students at HSIs are students of color. And that means that uh, these are institutions that are at the cutting edge of what the majority of our population of students are and will be as we go forward and not in significance pay attention to that. So back to the point of growth, because I gave you a, a sense of the, how far and fast it's grown, but really taking a look at the fact that, you know, about over 180% increase in the numbers of institutions that hit that enrollment threshold from 189 to 539. And as I mentioned, emerging HSIs, it looks like we're gonna have about 900 institutions within the next 10 years that are gonna hit that enrollment threshold. So I think paying attention, not just to our enrollment, but what is it we're actually doing to make sure we're meeting our students in such a way that they will be able to meet their goals and aspirations is significantly important. So uh, we also have released the latest data. So 25 years of HSIs was through um, 1819. We know now 1920 data that just 
was released about, um, we released this list about two weeks ago. We know that there are now 569 institutions. So just imagine in one year, 30 institutions have hit that enrollment threshold and they represent less than 20% of institutions, but they graduate, they enroll, excuse me, over 65% of all Hispanic students that are enrolled. And they actually graduate um, as of 2017, 18 data, um, over 60% of Hispanic students who graduate as well. So there's a significant representation here uh, and looking at resources and opportunity, if we're gonna make sure that the fast growing Hispanic population continues to get supported, looking at what these institutions are doing and can do is what drives Excellency to continue focusing on these institutions and those that are cut above and really paying attention to what it means to serve students overall. We also know that HSIs actually represent the majority of minority serving institutions by far. And often in public policy, there's a conversation about uh, MSIs, minority serving institutions. And when you take a look, whether it's HBCUs, tribal colleges that were created with mission to serve and approved by nation respectively, um, that we do have that significant growth over 25 years compared to those other groups of institutions. And that's important as we think about positioning where this is, given the diversity of institutions and the students that they serve. Uh, almost done with this, this. I hope this is helpful in looking at the context of HSIs themselves, but we know the pipeline of HSIs continues to grow. Um, we know that when you take a look at there are about the 30 states so far in 2019-20 that have Hispanic serving institutions in them, 30. And when we look at emerging HSIs, 38 institution states, excuse me, have at least one emerging HSI in them. So this is not just about uh, the five states where we've been working, it's incredibly important, but acknowledging that across the country, we do see that growth and that concentrated enrollment um, at institutions that have an opportunity to think about meeting students where they're at and helping them get a quality education. Last piece I wanted to, to share in this space, just as a point of personal privilege too, is paying attention to graduate education. A lot of our focus in public policy is in undergraduate education. It's critically important. Uh, but acknowledging that it's also the pipeline, not just from K-12 into higher ed, but also through graduate education. And while we've seen progress and growth in the numbers of HSIs that have graduate programs, we know that less than half actually have gradu offer graduate degrees, and they are very highly concentrated in four locations. And that means that paying attention to uh, the future of faculty and others from whence they come is really going to be important, is an important part of the HSI potential and role. We talk about these institutions and we know that um, because the definition is based on enrollment, that there's a potential to really focus on HSIs who became HSIs because of demography and geography and not because of intentionality and impact. And you know, we look at the top institutions graduating Hispanic students in a given year, and these are absolute numbers, not percent. It's so one way of paying attention to uh, better understanding, not just enrollment, but what do we see in terms of completion? Now, again, these are large institutions um, that we see here and the opportunity to see where do they fit in the national scope of enrolling and graduating Hispanic students is important. And thinking about what other measures do we need to understand? Uh, because if it's just demography and geography, it doesn't mean an institution has changed at all to meet students where they're at, or that there's an acknowledgement that the critical mass of Hispanic students enrolled creates an opportunity for an institution to think about what it's doing and transform and, and serve these students in a different way, rather than just waiting for students to accommodate and meet the needs of the institution. So we look at institutions like Miami Day, Southwest College, you know, Paso Community College, Valencia College, at the back at the associate level and at the baccalaureate level. Um, Florida International University and California State University of Fullerton and California State Northridge and Cal State Long Beach as, and you know, University of Texas Rio Grande Valley as institutions that uh, enroll and graduate large numbers of Hispanic students and thinking about what is it they're doing? Is it because of demography and geography or is it really intentionality and impact that we see the difference these institutions are making? At Excellencia, we said we talk about data, so um, I know I'm going to have to go a little bit faster through here, but we do look at multiple measures of impact and uh, equity gaps 
And at the national level, we still see there are opportunities to go look at graduation rates, which are critical, but the post-traditional looking at those that might have transferred to another institution who might have graduated at another institution or are still enrolled. And the opportunity to go beyond just numbers and graduation rates, we'll look at that opportunity to see institutional investment is an important opportunity for us. And we know that there are other measures of success. So it is about practice and what it is we're doing. At Excellencia, we capture that as much as we can through our examples of Excellencia. And there are many of those if you go to our website that you can see. So as we get to the end of this, I do just wanna focus on and give you a very quick snapshot. We have a lot of additional data that we could share with you, but we do wanna focus not just on the data, but on the action and what we can do to take responsibility for the change that we know needs to happen. Um, for our students and for the institutions to remain viable and strong parts of our community and, and the growth that's needed. So we get into key questions. We know enrollment is not sufficient. We know there needs to be more, but also as we see this growth to potentially 900 institutions in an enrollment threshold, what is it gonna take to really get to what we know is core and that is the serving, the intentionality needed. And for us, that means we're paying attention to the future of HSI. So we know that there's federal investments um, in these institutions, uh, CARES Act um, you know, the, and other CR, uh, SAA, I, mean, I can't even give you the acronyms of all these, they're at the federal level, so you see all those. Even the American Rescue Act, Plan Act that's come out, been presented and considered in the Department of Ed. But we know that there are other efforts we need to be paying attention to, um, like refocusing a lot of activities, looking online, increasing transparency, and that Excellencia, they were distinguishing institutions that are intentional in serving and not just in enrolling those students overall. For us, uh, that means after 22 years of listening and learning to institutions, we've got to find a way to reframe serving in a way that is constructive, allows us to look nationally across institutions in authentic ways, but that can tell us more uh, stringent uh, understanding of institutional effort and intentionality rather than just demography. And we have a certification process to help us understand that. It's broken down in data, practice, and leadership. We listen to institutions tell us that it's about what happens after a student enrolls and before they graduate. That's where they have a little bit more effort and control. There is publicly available data. And we also look at the practice and leadership that will help show intentionality. Uh, we've had this for two years, and in the process, we've had over 40 institutions apply, and we've had 14 institutions certified with the seal of Excellencia. And that shows that there's a higher standard and expectation of institutional effort to make that difference. And we have a community of common cause that's making this real. It's not just the, the seal process. So we have presidents for Latino student success is a sampling of some of the presidents that are working with us and their commitment to cause. This group of a little over 100 institutions, institutional leaders, they represent less than 5% of institutions, but they enroll one in four Hispanic students and they graduate one in three in this country. And so taking a look at those leaders and the efforts that are not just enrolling them, but are graduating them and seeing that kind of success is significantly important and shows what's possible. So I think the question for us is, what are you doing to make sure that you can accelerate, accelerate like, you know, college completion and define the future of HSI? So I know that was a lot. I'm going to stop sharing because um, the answer doesn't rest at Excellencia. It rests with those leaders who are with us and making a significant difference and showing and leading the way and educating us about the opportunities and potential. And I'd like to ask those to join us uh, is uh, President Erica Beck from California State University, Northridge, Chancellor uh, Michael Amadidis from uh, University of Illinois, Chicago, and President William Serata from El Paso Community College. Welcome, thank you all for joining us. Good to be here. Yes, thank you all. Um, I wanted to start, I know I, I put a lot out there, but uh, you all are, are on the ground making it happen day in and day out, uh, dealing with the challenges of pandemic and others, but all three of you uh, led organizations that uh, applied and earned the seal of excellencia. I know that Erica, You've transitioned and you're at a new institution and I know that you'll be looking for that, but all three of you led institutions that show data practice leadership. And if I could, I could start with you, President Sidata, what does earning the seal of excellence mean for you and your leadership here? 
No, I certainly appreciate it. And what an honor to be with uh, the panelists, with you, Dr. Santiago, as well as President um, Brown. Um, so for us, it is a continuation of improvement. And for us, we've, we've been long on this journey at El Paso Community College, where over 85% of our students are Hispanic or Latino. Um, and, and you're right, it's not just enrolling, it's, it's actually intentionally serving those students. And I'll share some data that we've looked at over the last 10 years and, and receiving the seal just um, codified our efforts, if you will, and ensures that we're headed in the right direction. But in the last 10 years, um, we've seen, we've, we continue to lead the nation in awarding associate degrees to Hispanic students um, as rated by Hispanic uh, Magazine. We, uh, we have seen the credit hours that our students have in order to earn, about, in order to earn an associate's degree drop from 103 to 79. That's occurred in the last eight years. Uh, we've seen the time to degree drop from five years to four years. That's in the last seven years. So we've had a very intentional focus on improving success rates. Um, and all of this data was right before the pandemic. Um, and obviously I have some fears with regards to the pandemic based on the data that you shared with us, but we have been in very intentional in ensuring that we're not only enrolling our students, but that we're serving them, we're helping them and assisting them get to the finish line and actually graduating. Thank you. I think that's, that's important acknowledging where you are, but the intentionality. Um, President Beck, as you mentioned that you are another institution that's doing amazing work for you and your team. Uh, and earn the seal in the inaugural year, all of you in that initial cohort. What does it mean to you to have been leading an organization that earned the seal and as you're looking to do so now? Yeah, thanks, Deborah. I mean, I'm so glad to be here also um, with such incredible leaders um, and leaders in a field that really um, holds a promise of a brighter and more equitable future for everybody that our um, academic community touches, but we know right, that that promise isn't equitably actualized on our campuses. Um, and changing that really has been my North Star uh, for my entire career, as, as you know. And so earning the seal, I will tell you, again, I told you when we earned it, um, was really the highest honor of my career. And I will tell you an incredible point of pride for the entire Cal State Channel Islands community. And in thinking about this seal, I actually find it helpful to remember your earlier comments um, that HSIs, unlike HBCUs and tribal colleges and universities, were not founded in service of equity. Um, and in fact, most were uh, historically white middle class serving institutions, right, that transformed into HSIs. And so, um, you know, achieving that designation isn't a reflection of an institution's success in advancing equity, but earning the seal is. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I'm incredibly proud that uh, of all the campuses that I have served, and I'm also really proud um, that they are all here. I was following the chat, uh, all three of them are here. Um, and this is particularly true of CSUN, but all of them um, really had um, a value system deeply rooted in equity and inclusion. Um, and the ways that that value system manifested uh, would show up in, in lots of places, especially in the hearts and minds of campus community um, who care really deeply about the success of our students. But we often lack the intentionality about how to get from a value system to tangible outcomes and genuine transformation. So for me, um, the SEAL is really a roadmap for how to get there, the data practice leadership framework. Um, and earning it meant that we really did transform the meaning of serving to serving with an equity and justice lens and moved from a place of wanting to enact equity to a place of actually beginning to do it. And we had substantive gains um, in reducing the equity gap and, and increasing overall student success. And yes, indeed, we will be seeking to do, uh, to do the same uh, work at, uh, continue to do that work at CSUN. Thank you, I appreciate that. Well, uh, and Chancellor, you know, you were part of that second cohort and uh, amazing given your size and the effort and where you are in, in Chicago that you're able to, to show that kind of intentionality and effort. What did it mean to you and your team to, to earn the seat? Well, thank you. Thank you, Deborah and Sarita, and thank you, Excellencia, for putting us together. I hope that when you were referring to the size, you were referring not to my personal size that is getting bigger and bigger during COVID, but more to the size of the institution. Uh, 
two, two words come to mind uh, when we're talking about what it means, right? It's, uh, first of all, it's recognition of the efforts that uh, staff members, faculty and students here at Chicago have put together for decades now uh, in, in building the, the infrastructure and building uh, the, the support network that we need. And at the same time, it's encouragement and a, a sense of responsibility that comes with uh, with the recognition and the and the award a commitment uh, to continue to be strategic intentional and focused on our efforts to advance uh, our our latinx students undergraduate graduate and professional students uh, it's also a responsibility to continue being an anchor institution not only for chicago but for our latinx community in chicago through our community research projects through the services that we provide and in our case through the healthcare delivery uh, system that we have and serves uh, the, the latinx uh, neighborhoods uh, next to us and i think uh, as i mentioned i think it goes uh, william talked about uh, about statistics and, and they're very strong statistics for our latinx uh, undergraduate students, uh, but it goes beyond the undergraduates. It's the doctoral students, it's the professional students. The University of Illinois at Chicago has been the largest producer of Latino physicians in the country, in the continental US for the last 30 years now. So that reaffirms our commitment to continue doing what we have been doing. So we're very proud of the seal. Thank you, and I so appreciate the comment because you know, uh, earning the steel doesn't mean that you've got it all right, but that you're in that direction, that intentionality matters, and you try to, to go from that intentionality and measure it so that you know, and I know that, that uh, President Sadat also mentioned it, President Back. So if I could just jump to you, President Back, and you'd mentioned, um, you know, the importance of not just uh, having an aspiration, but actualizing. Um, how do you use your data to kind of advance equity and and expand the kind of investment you know you need at an institution like uh, CSUN going forward to make sure that you can continue to do well and right by your students. It's such an important question, Deborah. You know, I'm, a, I'm an experimental psychologist by training. And so in my field, we are trained to measure the weight of smoke. Um, so for me, uh, the idea of using data to advance equity always begins with a conversation about building a collective understanding and operationalizing terms that can be measured with the campus community. So I often start with questions like, what do we mean? by equity. Um, if we were to become a truly equitable and just academic community tomorrow, how would we know? Uh, what would look different than it does now? What would we be resourcing, to your point, that we aren't now? How would we measure progress and, and communicate it so that it would guide behavior across the university um, and lead us to the outcomes that we seek? So I would say one pretty consistent challenge that I've encountered in the course of this work is that we all have really salient personal experiences with students and they're really powerful because we experience them firsthand and we all have stories of students who have impacted us. And we often extrapolate those to assume that they are reflective of the student body as a whole, but they're actually only reflective of the students with whom we have had personal experiences. So on a campus my size with almost 40,000 students, even the world's, you know, most quantitatively adept human could never process that kind of data with any accuracy. Um, so getting to the data piece is really vital, but it's also really critical that it's clear data, that it's actionable data, that it's data that is meaningful to people who are not quantitatively inclined, and that it includes an honest assessment of where we are, including where we have failed, but can do better. Um, I often think of it in, in um, like science, right? It's successive iterations at the truth. By following the data, we can embrace a growth mindset, we can do more of what works, and we can stop doing what does not advance our goals. I think the other really critical piece uh, from the data perspective is really using patterns in the data to create intentional spaces for faculty, staff, and students to ask questions about why the data looks the way that it does and problem solve together so that we can really reject the notion that any equity gap at all is acceptable um, and eliminate them in perpetuity. And, and to your point, right, the work is never done. We never just get there. We never really, you know, it, it, but it's always pushing us a little further. And the, the data can really tell us um, which direction to go, as opposed to trying to figure it out in our head. 
Right. Not insignificant as somebody who uh, claims, and I'm proud to be a data nerd, uh, but it only goes so far. It can inform something, but the context really matters now you understand the data. Thank you, President Beck. Appreciate that. Um, uh, President Sadata, you mentioned data as well, and you talked about uh, what you saw in the previous year, and now we've got this pandemic, and we know when we look at data from the National Student Clearinghouse and others that um, all institutions have been impacted, Hispanic students definitely, and certainly community colleges. So um, how do you make sure that you're, you pivot? How do you pivot and, and continue to lead and serve when you've got such a big challenge in front of the pandemic and enrollment issues? Oh, it's a great question, Dr. Santiago, and it's something that we, we pay close attention to. And so we know that um, this past fall, our enrollment uh, was down nine and a half percent. This spring, it's down 12 percent. We look at the proportions, obviously serving 85 um, percent of our enrollment is Hispanic. So that's the segment of the enrollment that was that was hit the hardest. Um, and quite frankly, we also look at the, the gender difference. Um, we continue to see a, a decline in males. We had a 15 percent decline in male enrollment enrollment versus an 8% decline in female enrollment. And this becomes part of the process of the data that we look at. And quite frankly, it may shift everything that we do. Uh, we know that we will be uh, the, in a virtual environment. We are continuing that through the summer. We anticipate that we'll be 50% of our sections offered face-to-face -face in the fall and 50% online. Uh, but we have to encourage and we have to engage our Latino students in enrolling. Uh, the biggest decline that we saw was in first time in college students. And that is a, a significant concern because the data is overwhelming. If they don't enroll immediately the, the summer or fall after high school graduation, the likelihood in our region that they are ever on a credential is 1%. And so we have to mitigate that. We have to do our best to, to uh, make a change in that and ensure that our students, you know, if it's online, at least take one class, take two classes, but don't not enroll because the data is overwhelming against you. So I think it's just a matter of us continuing to look, use the data. I'm a data nerd as well, Dr. Santiago. So I, I proudly uh, embrace that, but look at the data, look at what's working. Again, Excellencia has provided us with so many avenues uh, of promising practices and being able to implement those to serve the students that, uh, that we are receiving and ensure that we're facilitating their success. So important. Taking action and that leadership is significantly important. And we've tried to identify practices. You mentioned, appreciate that um, very much and thinking that through. We know there's so much more out there, but it, it does take money. It takes investment. Uh, it takes leadership, but it takes investment and paying attention to where we are with where we need to be. Uh, Chancellor, you've, uh, you know, you've, you've seen this, you've been successful in gaining some, some investment, some support for the hard work you all are doing in your team at, at UIC. But, but how do you secure kind of an equity of, of federal funding as well, not just uh, equity of effort as President Beck was mentioning, so that you can be supported uh, as you serve these students that have significant opportunity and, and financial need? Well, uh, first of all, let me express, I think, a general sentiment across the, the higher education uh, sector, HSIs, MSIs, to the federal government, and, and I hope, I know the, the academic community here is en masse, but I hope that some of the, of the staff members uh, are, are here also, for what the, uh, the legislators were able to do to emphasize the need of the uh, HSIs, MSIs, historically black colleges and universities during the distribution of the three first packages that, uh, that uh, the federal government put together. I also want uh, to point out how, uh, how excited we are with the commitment of the, of the Hispanic caucus and other groups uh, in Washington, their commitment to extending the Pell Grants because many of us have high numbers of Pell recipients, uh, extending them for the summer and extending them to DACA students, which is uh, something very, very important uh, that we all of us support. Uh, there is another opportunity, and that's a very significant opportunity with the American Jobs Plan. Uh, the American Jobs Plan uh, will address uh, human infrastructure. Now, we know how sausage is made in Washington, uh, whether it's going to be one bill, two bills, how it's going to happen. There's a lot of things up in the air right now. Uh, but I hope that as, as the process uh, goes on, uh, and, and the, the limited information that we have is that there are also significant infrastructure investments uh, that they are uh, contemplated right now right. In, in research 
and highly qualified and specialized talent in terms of doctoral students, postdoctoral students, uh, some uh, centers of excellence is what we have seen in part of the language. So I know that this is a very critical investment. It's important for all of us. Uh, it's even more important for the AS HSI universities that they have graduate programs and specifically doctoral programs, R1 institutions. So we are thrilled and excited about it and, and we're ready to be engaged to the discussions at all levels. Uh, we understand the challenges, we understand the, uh, the opportunities, uh, and uh, we can help uh, agencies and the, the caucus to make uh, sound investments, because that's important for this act, Absolutely. that the investments are sound investments and will indeed improve the infrastructure. That's critically important. Thank you, and thank you all. I wish we could talk to you all for much longer. The, the leadership is clear, the opportunity that to, to look at what you're doing and inform others and band together to make sure our common cause of student success is there. Uh, so I'm sorry we can't talk longer, but I do wanna make sure to, to acknowledge that as leaders that have earned the seal and committed to cause, uh, we should all be paying attention to what they do going forward and look to the kind of leadership as we need to look at uh, national efforts overall. So I'm gonna turn it back to you. That was a wonderful conversation. In addition to hearing the dialogue between institutional leaders and you, Deborah, it's been great to see the amount of input that we're getting in the chat uh, and to see the engagement across this conversation. Collectively, this whole enterprise is about Latino student success. And for all of us, we think about students, we consider our impact on them, and we strive to serve them well. In the five briefings that we held across this country, we were able to capture student voice. And we want now to share with you just a little bit of the vibrance, the, the, the aspirations, and the optimism of Latino students who together we are striving to serve. Our university is constantly moving the needle on, on aiding in student success and, and pushing those metrics. And I see my future not, not like a possibility, but more of a certainty because of those who have championed Hispanic leadership in government. Yeah, I just wanted to be a part of like this, this increasing network of uh, students just like me. The environment nurtures that kind of mentality, you know, to continuously learn and to continuously work on yourself. You know, we can talk about that family bond that we have. How do you leave home? Where do you go? And I think the intentionality that UCF provides, you know, we have a lot of visual cues and signals showing that we're a Hispanic serving institution. And it's not, not a blanket statement. I feel like with academia, there's a bunch of different ways that you could go. I will bring the lessons that my professors have taught me to wherever I may end up. Coming from a low income, single parent household, I thought the college wasn't for me. However, whenever I got accepted into the University of Texas, I knew then that it was time to write my own story. So with all odds stacked against me, I decided to take the challenge head on. To me, my degree is much more than a piece of paper. My degree is my yes when everyone else has told me no. To my family, my degree is much more than financial need, math, and physics. My degree is a legacy of hope and inspiration, not only for my siblings, but for every Latino out there who believes that they can't do it. Because whenever we have each other, we have the power to change the world. That is just a bit of the inspiration that all of us carry with us as we do this work. And it is focused on the future. With that kind of wind at our back, it is my pleasure to call on our new US Secretary, Miguel Cardona, to bring us greetings. Hola, soy Miguel Cardona, Secretario de Educación. I'm here to celebrate the 25th anniversary of HSI's Hispanic Serving Institutions. Thank you, Excelencia, for acknowledging this sector and the important work that HSI's play in student success across the country. We know equity is a big focus for us moving forward. We know that institutions like HSI's play a major role in that. So when we're talking about recovery as a country, we need to acknowledge HSI's and the important work that they do to promote equity and access for all students Thank you, HSIs, and thank you, Excelencia. And thank you, Secretary Cardona. 
Deborah and I have had several opportunities to speak with the secretary, and we are really energized by the team he is building, made up of education champions, equity advocates, people who understand the work that is before us and the public-private partnership quality that is available when we look in the same direction, we agree about how to measure success and how to move forward. So we are gratified that Secretary Cardona has us, has this agenda on his radar and it's just beginning. As we focus on the future, we intend to do all that is available to us, to use our agency, to use the jargon, to activate those who care about these issues and are ready to put an action agenda into play. It is my pleasure to introduce such a person. She is a freshman to the Congress. She represents the great state of New Mexico and, we, and she serves on the House Labor and Education Committee. I am talking about Representative Teresa Ledger Fernandez. Please, let's hear from her right now. Hello, everyone. I'm Congresswoman Teresa Ledger Fernandez, serving New Mexico's beautiful and beautifully diverse third congressional district, celebrating the impact of 25 years of federal investment in higher education through Hispanic serving institutions must also be a call to action to increase our investment. We invest in the things we believe in. We believe in our students. We believe in the value of education. Nowhere is that investment more needed than for our Latino students. We know that education is key to our country's economic recovery. Education is key to transforming the economic and social inequities we are living through in this moment. In Congress and on the House Education and Labor Subcommittee on Higher Education, I will push for significant infrastructure for our HSI students, colleges, and universities. I support Excelencia in Education's mission to accelerate Latino student success in higher education. We benefit from their important research, evidence-based programs, and growing network of institutional leaders. Adelante y muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Representative Ledger Fernandez. Deborah and I are eager to get to know your vision for your tenure to think with you about the relationship with the full Congressional Hispanic Caucus, with the chairman, and with all members of Congress. Because what we will be embarking on is a road that requires a higher education for more Americans. And we are energized by the opportunity to work together. At this point, Deborah Santiago joins me because at this point in our discussion, this is about what Excelencia in Education is committing to you to do, how it is that we will be available to be a resource, to be a website, to be a set of professionals who will listen and learn with you. And so with that, to set this, this, this conversation up, Deborah, let's take a look at our tactical plan for Latino student success. Yeah, thank you, Sarita. I think, you know, when we started the conversation a couple of minutes ago, we mentioned, uh, we asked what others can do. And uh, these wonderful institutional leaders shared some of what they are doing. Um, and we heard some of what students are looking for. And we know that uh, you have to lead, uh, you have to model the behavior you want to see. And so at Excelencia, we've been working the 17 years we've been around, but also continue to figure out what's our tactical plan to add value to what is certainly an agenda that's bigger than us and has many involved, but what we can get our hands around. And so we put together just kind of a, a concrete sense of what it means for us as we think about a tactical plan for addressing Latino student success in this pandemic and prior and acknowledging that systemic and structural inequities uh, preceded us, but this is happening on our watch. And we need to make sure that we are paying attention to how we as a small organization can contribute to what needs to happen nationally and with those allies of common cause that care about uh, these issues. So what you see here is our attempt to 
uh, make a commitment to what we can do in a tactical plan. And that means we're designing, and you look at our, our portfolio of work, this is what you see. We're trying to design a national acceleration plan and, and track degree completion and, and be advocates for what we know needs to happen and the potential of our students and community. Uh, listening to students, listening to institutional leaders. Um, overall, we're trying to replicate what we know is working, bringing attention to it and celebrating it, but letting others know there's no excuse for inaction because there are people across the country who are doing this already. Um, and we know that to do so as an organization, we have to continue to evolve in order to support, to support the institutional transformation that I know is needed. Um, and that's a sum of what we're doing. Sarita, you wanna finish this off here? Absolutely. I, I think just in the deference to the fact that there is a great deal that we are getting ready to amplify and extend and do, I'm going to double down on the build a community of common cause. This is fundamental because all of you who are here with us today have the opportunity to be part of that community. There are methods for you to engage in excellency in action, whether it you as an individual, whether it be at representing a program level work, or as it is, if it is to talk with the institutional leaders with whom you work. That community of common cause is how Deborah and I began our focus on what are the assets in our community, who are the righteous people in every sector, and how will higher education lead and be the place that will absorb the talent of Latino students and propel them into the future. The work that we are going to do through all of these bullets as it relates to action, program, measurement, resources, are available through our website. This last bullet of being a trusted intermediary is a role that we are taking quite seriously. We are not going to be at all, but we are going to be the place that will be fierce about the need for change and that now is the time to intentionally serve Latino students while serving all students. We are thrilled at the level of engagement both from everyone that we've gathered to present to you, but also from the level of activity of this audience. What you see in this slide are those who committed when the project of 25 years of HSIs was an idea. They put their shoulder to the wheel with us to put the analysis into the public and to bring this conversation to you. The people who we've made common cause with here in Washington, in government, both elected officials and appointed, they're just some of the people that we'll work with. And we would be remiss without punctuating again that we as two leaders of this organization come to you with the product of the efforts, investment of our team. If you don't know them, look at them on our website. Know that they are part of our effort. Finally, this briefing, this national briefing is the first public effort by a new strategic partnership with the University of Texas at Austin. We thank the team there and most particularly a shout out for Henry Tijerina for all he has done to make this briefing a success. We look forward to staying in touch, staying together y hasta la próxima.